The Federal Reserve is going to stop making new loans from its March 2023 emergency bank facility today. Now, there's still $164 billion being borrowed from it, including a surprising increase in that balance just last week. What are the implications and ramifications for shutting down the bank term funding program that had gotten a little bit away from its original purpose with this arbitrage free-for-all Wall Street? How much of that was free money? How much of that was still banks requiring the Fed to, to fund their operations? It wasn't a particularly healthy sign that banks had become so interested in lending to the Fed by borrowing from the Fed rather than to each other and then to anyone else in the real economy. So the use of the bank term funding program all the way up until today has been sort of a mixed bag, leaving us with more questions than answers. But then again, that's the real purpose of the Federal Reserve and its programs, just to buy time not to make any answers or to give any answers about problems potentially in the banking system. As it stands, the BTFP shutting down from new loans the issue may not necessarily be the BTFP or the Fed, but, as usual, collateral. So let's take apart the BTFP as it starts to end its life and what that means over the near term and maybe even the intermediate term as we turn more and more toward other issues on bank balance sheets. Yes, I'm talking about commercial real estate. Well, let's go back to last March, March 12th of 2023. Silicon Valley Bank had just failed. The Fed got together, obviously in consultation with other banks, and came up with the BTFP because the tools that it always says it has to use in any crisis to successfully stop any crisis, they found out they didn't have the tools and they needed to invent a new one. But this one was a one with a peculiar and particular aspect to it. From the press release, the Fed said, Additional funding will be made available through the creation of a new bank term funding program, offering loans of up to one year in length to banks, savings associations, credit unions, and other eligible depository institutions, pledging U.S. treasuries, agency debt, and mortgage-backed securities, and other qualifying assets as collateral. These assets, here's the key, will be valued at par. The BTFP will be an additional source of liquidity against high quality securities, eliminating an institution's need to quickly sell those securities in times of stress. Because the Fed at least learned that lesson from the 2008 experience, the monetary, not financial crisis. And that was when banks have different difficulties with liquidity, they have to raise liquidity oftentimes by selling assets that they wouldn't otherwise be selling into illiquid markets that become even more illiquid, leading to this downward vicious cycle where illiquid markets lead to forced selling and forced selling leads to more illiquid markets. Prices go down, more selling, and on and on and on. So the Fed didn't want to have banks into a forced selling regime, which would lead to all sorts of the negative consequences. So they came up with the BTFP because they never really told us. It has something to do with collateral because they keep talking about how these treasuries would be valued at par. But we keep learning more, especially over the years since the crisis happened, about insufficiency, insufficiency in collateral among all of these banks. And that's not necessarily about treasuries where they're valued but what banks have available that they can mobilize as collateral to either use at the Federal Reserve's window or in the private marketplace. While the BTFP was meant to be an initial bank rescue, its actual use, especially toward the end here, got to be muddied by changes in interest rates. Now, what the Federal Reserve said was they were going to charge OIS plus 10 basis points, 12-month OIS plus, 12 basis, plus 10 basis points, which as rates started to fall and forward markets started to decrease, markets looking ahead to lower rates in 2024, the 12-month OIS rate started to go down too, which meant that if you were a depository institution in particular, you could borrow from the Fed's BTFP at 12-month OIS plus 10 and then just hold the reserves and get paid IOR, which was well above. And by the time we got to the end of January, January 24th in particular, OIS, the 12-month OIS was up around, was down around 
while IOR at the time was still 5.4%. So you got half a percentage point spread in your favor for absolutely no risk. Again, that's the part that I, that I think is the most important aspect, that banks were more willing, more than willing, to just arbitrage the Federal Reserve than to go out in this tremendous Goldilocks economy and find all sorts of better paying opportunities. No risk arbitrage at the Fed. I mean, it makes sense in one context, and that context isn't necessarily a no landing, soft landing. The context for arbitraging the Fed is, I don't see anything better paying or better paying on a risk adjusted basis out there in the real economy. So more banks were interested in arbitraging the Fed than they were actually expanding their balance sheet and expanding their activities in the real economy. But you can imagine the uh, discussions at the FOMC with all the negative press that ended up being generated because of this free-for-all bailout of Wall Street as it public perception came to, came to turn toward it. So on January 2024, as I mentioned in a video not a couple days after that, the Fed said, First of all, March 11th comes, we're shutting this thing down because March 11th will be the 366th day because it's New Year here, leap year here. So March 11th, they're going to shut it down. But in between from January 25th forward to March 11th, they eliminated the arbitrage by making sure that the rate that any bank pays in order to borrow from the BTFP is basically where IOR actually is. And not surprising ever since January 25th, the BTFP has peaked and started to move a little bit lower ever since then. The peak was $167.8 billion. It was only ever paid back in small amounts since then. And then last week, March 6th, the BTFP actually increased by $548 million. Now, that's not a huge amount, $548 million, certainly not in the grand scheme of things, or even in the context of BTFP. However... What it shows is that some bank or banks were still willing to go to the BF, BTFP and for, it couldn't have been for the arbitrage purposes because the Fed shut those down. So why were bank, why was a bank or several banks still borrowing from the BTFP last week, increasing their borrowing from the BTFP last week? Especially since the rate on it is increasingly uncompetitive where expectations for interest rates over the next year are declining. Did a bank suddenly run out of funding options and have no other choice? That's really the question that we have here. How much of the BTFP was actual arbitrage and how much of the BTFP was instead banks that still don't have access to funding markets, are still experiencing liquidity issues and are using this program as a liquidity buffer, if nothing worse. That's what we need to find out moving forward. And as the BTFP is shut down, we're going to find out relatively quickly just how much of arbitrage versus bank funding there actually is. When you go back a year ago, March of 2023, the middle part of March of 2023, the BTFP started out with its first week at $11.9 billion. Then it shot up with another $41.7 billion the week of March 22nd. That was after Credit Suisse had failed. Another $10 billion at the end of March. And then $14.6 billion March 5th. So that the first four weeks of its operation, there was $79 billion in loans. Now, some of those loans may have been paid back over the years since then because there is no prepayment penalty from the Federal Reserve. However, it wouldn't be unreasonable to believe the vast majority is still outstanding. Starting tomorrow, some of, a big portion of that $79 billion over the next month is going to have to be repaid. How is it going to be repaid? Are banks going to go to the discount window to repay those loans? Are they going to dip into their own uh, reserves, assuming they have them, cash reserves, in order to repay the Federal Reserve? Are they going to go in the private marketplace, into repo? Are they going to use something like broker deposits, which is something that we've seen over the last several quarters, an uptick in the level of broker deposits, especially at medium-sized regional banks? Are they going to tap into other, are they going to be able to tap into other funding sources in order to repay a substantial chunk of this Fed BTFP? That's the question. We'll start to get answers over the weeks ahead and relatively quickly, given how many loans were in the first month of its operation. As banks switch to the discount window, that might suggest they're not getting bad news that they're not getting they're not having access to private funding sources. 
The good news would be that at least they have collateral because collateral is the big key constraint here, as I'll get to in a second. They could also go to the FHLB, the Federal Home Loan Banks, and get some advances there because FHLB advances are still substantial. As of the fourth quarter last year, there's about $781.5 billion in advances outstanding, which was only about a $24 billion improvement from the $805 billion that was outstanding in the third quarter. So FHLB advances seem to be leveling off at around three quarters of a trillion here. I'm sure the federal home loan banks, assuming anyone has to roll off the BTFP and wanted to go to FHLB, assuming they had the collateral, they'll be able to do so. But that's what we keep coming back to. The issue isn't the Fed, its reserves, its bailouts. It's access to any of these, including the private marketplace. In order to access the Fed, uh, to order to access the FHLB, to access repo markets outside of broker deposits where you don't have to have collateral, you're going to have to have collateral. And we keep coming back to this problem over and over again. One of the key unappreciated aspects, one of the key unappreciated problems in March 2023 was the lack of collateral availability, not just funding availability, but collateral that unlocks all of this funding availability. Back in January, just before the Fed issued its press release saying we're shutting down the BTFP, I mentioned this in another video too, the G30 put out a report on last year's bank crisis. And long story short, they said, there's lots of problems with all of these central bank lender of last resort activities like the BTFP and the discount window, simply because there isn't enough collateral. And specifically with the three banks in the United States that failed last year, the G30 report said the three banks were not able to access the discount window on time and in sufficient scale in March, March 2023, largely because they could not mobilize the eligible collateral rapidly enough. And other institutions have taken this a step further, actually digging into it a little bit more, this collateral issue that keeps coming up time and time again. The BIS, back in October 2023, similarly put together a report, not a thick one, not a detailed report, but a, a, a report that dug a little bit further into the collateral issues and the funding issues at these banks, although they should have gone further into Credit Suisse. But either way, they came up with this in uh, last October. During the final days before its failure, Silicon Valley Bank's operational weaknesses became apparent as it struggled to execute on its contingency funding plans. For example, SVB did not test its capacity to borrow at the Federal Reserve discount window in 2022 and did not have appropriate collateral operational arrangements in place to obtain liquidity. Even worse, and this is the part that I keep coming back to and the part that I mentioned last year repeatedly, They've got assets on their balance sheet. Why didn't they package them into some other form of collateral? Well, as the BIS uh, uncovers, Signature Bank actually did at least try to do so, which raises some questions, which we'll get to in a second. As in the case of SVB, SBNY, Signature Bank, had operational weaknesses with regards to its contingency funding plan. For example, during 2021 and 2022, SBNY increased lending in the form of capital call and subscription loans. And I have a hunch this is one of the things you're going to keep coming back to when you dig into regional banks. They were heavy into subscription loans, which were a form of bridge financing to limited partnerships all throughout the financial landscape. Essentially, the way for limited partnerships to raise funds without having to go to the limited partners and do irregular capital calls. So if you have just cash flow management needs or you want to jump on a deal before you go to the next capital call, you get a bridge loan from one of these banks. It's collateralized against the fund's investor commitments. Not necessarily, and I don't think it has any recourse to the underlying assets. It's really against the, the LP's promises to pay. But I think there was a lot of this type of credit out there. And in the context of Signature Bank, they were trying to use these bridge loans as collateral for their own funding. Back to the BIS. SBNY intended to pledge these loans to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York as collateral for discount window lending. However, FRBNY would not accept the loans as collateral because they were not eligible. SBNY pursued efforts to pledge these loans for months, hiring law firms to make the case for, the FR, for FRBNY to accept them. During the week that SBNY failed, management tried unsuccessfully to pledge this portfolio to 
FRBNY, even though SBNY management knew they did not have a formally confirmed avenue to obtain liquidity from this portfolio, they continued to try to include these loans in collateral calculations just hours before the institution failed. And how many, how many market participants rejected their same overtures? That's really the question here. While these loans may have been ineligible at FRBNY's uh, discount window, what about in the private marketplace? Why didn't other collateral providers say, we'll take these loans? I think the question answers itself. These loans were just not up to sufficient quality given the market conditions at the time, especially liquidity problems, where the private marketplace wasn't willing to package them into some usable form of collateral either. So we do get a little bit more detail, a little more insight into what really happened last year and more and more we keep coming back to collateral. As the Bank Policy Institute said in January in response to the G30 report, it is better for society if banks keep making loans to businesses and households that they can pledge as collateral to the discount window than simply requiring banks to hold ever larger stockpiles of reserves at the Fed or lend even more to the U.S. Treasury and that the entire liquidity regulation framework warrants careful review and reconsideration. What they're saying is these banks don't have the treasuries. They don't have the collateral that's eligible. They have, like Signature Bank, a bunch of loans that aren't necessarily going to be easily packaged and transformed into a useful form of collateral. And we would rather have the banking system worry about making loans than trying to package them into collateral. This is the same problem we had in 2008, though not to nearly the same extent. And it continues to be an issue bubbling up in the background all along. And that background has become a little bit more important as the, we go forward in commercial real estate. Just recently, Bloomberg reported, this was just last month, the shakeout in the 20 trillion US commercial real estate market has long been delayed for a simple reason. No one could figure out just how much properties were worth. No one wanted to take the losses. And more crucially, few wanted to find out. Transactions ground to a halt as potential sellers were unwilling to unload buildings at distressed prices, an outcome that allowed them to pretend nothing had fundamentally changed. For many, the time to wait it out is nearing its end. Across the country, deals are starting to pick up, revealing just how far real estate prices have fallen. That's spurring widespread concern about losses that could ripple across the financial system, as well as potential liquidity setbacks because the loans that are tied to these are not going to be easily packaged into collateral either. You better have treasuries to go to the discount window. You better have something for the BTFP. You better have something for the repo market because these loans, whether they be bridge loans or any other type of loans, CNBS loans, CRE mortgages, all of it, they're not going to be useful as collateral either. Okay, so let's recap where we are. Today, the Federal Reserve is going to stop making loans on the BTFP, and the immediate implication is nothing. Nothing's going to happen tomorrow, the day after, the day after that. It's what happens from here. Really, over the next month, we'll find out how many banks were actually using the BTFP as a source of actual operational liquidity and how many were just arbitraging the Fed. And where, it really, where the rubber really hits the road here is as commercial real estate begins to start taking losses and deals and prices and valuations begin to converge on some form of equilibrium that is going to raise some difficult issues for some firms across the financial system that's going to cause several to, to maybe have to take a second look at their liquidity. In other words, it isn't exactly about the BTFP. It isn't about shutting down the BTFP and forcing banks to go elsewhere. It's what the BTFP and shutting it down might actually tell us about the real state of collateral sufficiency, funding sufficiency, and everything else in the banking system. So the BTFP doesn't lead to a liquidity crisis, but it might be able to tell us how close we are to something like that being a realistic risk. We aren't there yet, just to be clear. Commercial real estate problem hasn't led to any of these types of activities that we're trying to avoid. But with the BTFP shutting down and revealing something about the, the maybe the true state of underlying fundamentals here, monetary and financial fundamentals, that can help us discern what the real risks are going forward.
Not everything in the monetary realm is risk, 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 risk. There are some developments taking place that are hopeful for the long run future. The monetary evolution, a conversation I had with Ryan Sachs, that's the one linked below. As always, I thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, your University members and subscribers. Until next time, take care.